Okay. So let's just we'll, we'll start with a little bit of review. So what we were talking about yesterday is like, how do we figure out new information in science? Like, what, what do we do? And so what we talked about was we start by asking questions usually. Scientists want to answer questions. And um, after they have a question they're trying to figure out, they, they make a hypothesis. They, they say, okay, here's what I think. Based on what I know about this subject, I think this is going to happen in my experiment. And then they test it. And that's the purpose of an experiment is to test a hypothesis. Test if what you thought is actually confirmed by some data. And so they, they set up an experiment to test their hypothesis. And then they look, okay, I did my experiment and I'm going to look at the data I collected. Does it support my hypothesis of what I thought before? Does it not support it? Is it kind of inconclusive? They figure out what their data says about their hypothesis, and then they come up with a conclusion. And the conclusion is either, I accepted my hypothesis, what I said earlier, I was right. Okay, my um, prediction was correct. Or maybe they say, no, actually, what I thought was correct about this experiment is actually not. It didn't turn out the way I had predicted. That's okay as well because that might give you some new questions that you might ask, right? And, and further area to follow. So that's sort of what scientists do. That's how science works often. And we talked about some of the specifics. Um, one important thing about a hypothesis is that it's a prediction and it has to be a statement. Sometimes students make the mistake of like making it a question. Your hypothesis is never a question. It's always a statement. If we give plants extra fertilizer, then they will grow taller, right? It's a prediction about what's going to happen in the experiment. Often we phrase it as if I change this, then this is going to happen. If I give students a cup of coffee as they walk into my classroom, they are going to focus more on their notes. That might be a hypothesis. I could test. Maybe uh, tomorrow when you come in, I was going to give you each a cup of coffee, track your eyes and see how much you look at the screen. I'm not actually going to do that. But that would be a hypothesis. You could test that. right? We could set up that experiment. We could envision that. When we are doing an experiment, we usually have multiple groups, okay? We don't just have a single group and change it and see what happens. We have to usually have a control group. A control group is the one we use for comparison. And Kaya said this yesterday, that the control group, you sort of keep it under normal conditions. Try not to change anything. So then in the experimental group, when you do change something, you could compare it to the control and say, okay, well, under normal conditions, this is what happens. But then I change this. Here's how the results change. And that's why we have those two groups, the control group and the experimental group. Sometimes we might have more than one experimental group. Right? We might test various levels of something. And here, for example, here was an experiment, right? Fertilized plants versus unfertilized plants. This is the control group. This is the experimental group. So I change something, and now I can compare. I can say, well, this fertilized group, those plants grew, you know, quite a bit taller than the unfertilized group. So that control group is giving me something I can use for a comparison. Okay. In the in the experimental group, we change the independent variable, the one thing that we're trying to alter in our experiment. Okay, so let's review the variables. So in an experiment, the one thing we're changing, here's what I tell students sometimes if they get confused, the I in the word independent looks like the number one because it's the one thing you're changing in your experiment. 
right? I'm only going to change the amount of nitrogen I'm giving the plants. The one thing I change is the independent variable. The temperature that I heat up my enzyme mixture to, that's the one thing I'm changing. I try and keep everything else the same. That's the independent variable. I looks like a one. I have two groups of students. Some I give vitamin C, some I don't. That's what's going to be different between the groups. That's the one thing. That's the independent variable. So you could connect in your mind maybe the I and independent with that number one. So it's the factor in the experiment you're changing or altering. The dependent variable, this is the one you're sort of um, exploring the data you're collecting to see how it's going to change. You know, the information you're going to use is going to make your conclusion. I usually say that if you remember the D independent goes with the data. It's the data you're collecting at the end of your experiment that might help you to remember it. So in the pea plants, it was the height of the pea plant. That's the data I was going to collect to help me make a conclusion. That's the dependent variable. It's how fast the enzymes work. It's how many people got a cold in my experiment. Those are the data I would collect that's going to get, allow me to make my conclusion. And then we have a whole bunch of other things. Variables held constant is what we call them. So if I'm trying to make only one thing different in my groups, there must be a whole bunch of things I'm trying to keep the same. Right? In those plants I showed you, I gave one more, more fertilizer than the other, but I need to keep the type of soil the same. I need to keep the amount of water the same, the temperature, all those other little things. I need to make sure they're the same so I have a good experiment. Because if what those things are different, I'm going to be confused. I'm not going to know, did those other plants grow taller because of the fertilizer? Or was it because one was in the sun and one wasn't? Or maybe they had different amounts of water? So it confuses your experiment if you change more than one. Okay, I think that's where we left off yesterday. So part of the exper process of science is to observe your experiment. And you guys observed yesterday, right? You observed your slugs. Ob observations are sort of collecting data. It could be using your eyes like you did yesterday. You just observed your slugs for a while. It might be done once only. For example, the pea plants, you might just measure them after five weeks. Or you might do it over time, right? I might measure them every day for five weeks. Sometimes these observations, we call them quantitative. That means they have a number with them, like quantity. Like if I have a quantity of lettuce in this bag, that's the amount. Quantitative observations have a number with them. Qualitative observations don't. Most of what you were doing yesterday with the slug was qualitative observation. You said it's slimy, it's brown, it is on the side of the dish. What was a quantitative observation you made yesterday? Anyone think of one? Okay. The number, yeah, if you counted the slugs, that would be quantitative because we have a number with it. How about another one? When you were writing down your observations, were there any numbers that you wrote down? The number of antenna, good. Yeah. There's one other thing that we did sort of at the end. And I gave you those rulers, you may have measured the length of the slug or the height. Um, I think Isaiah, you measured the height of the slug, right? And you might have said it's 1.5 centimeters. That's quantitative. It has a number with it. Now, sometimes we put our, our data that we're collecting, our observations in a chart, a data table, we would call it. We might graph data. You'll be graphing data soon. Um, so we use different ways to show our data that sometimes makes it 
more easy to visualize than just a bunch of numbers. So examples, measuring the height of the plants every day. That's an observation I might make. Measuring how much gas is produced by my enzyme. Figuring out how many people got a cold during my experiment. Those are all examples of observation. After you have the data, you use it to make a conclusion. You look at the data, you might have to do some math with it. You might have to take a bunch of numbers and find the average. You might use some statistics on the data to figure out if it's a significant difference. But you look at the data in some way and that allows you to decide if you should support your hypothesis that you came up with or not. You, can, you, you compare the control group to the experimental group and you look if there's a significant difference. So for example, in the, in the experiments we're talking about as our examples, if the pea plants that were given fertilizer grew average of 8.3 centimeters taller than the control plants, I would say maybe my hypothesis was supported that fertilizer does help pea plants grow taller or that the enzyme had lower activity when it was heated up to 40 degrees or that there was no difference. You could have a high uh, conclusion that says there was no difference. The people I gave vitamin C got the cold just as much as the other folks. So my hypothesis was rejected. Any of those are possible um, end results of your experiment. So what do you do once you're done? You know, if you've done your experiment, you collected some data, you analyzed the data. Well, if you have supported your hypothesis, one good thing to do is to repeat the experiment. Because sometimes you might end up with an experiment where like the results are just kind of weird or you aren't exactly sure. So for example, if Cade does that pea plant experiment and he finds a difference, well, it, maybe he just had some weird pea plants, right? One happened to go taller than the other. But if also Isaiah does the same experiment, Kaya does the same experiment, and five other students do it, and everybody is getting the same result, now we could start to be more sure that, okay, seven or eight groups did the same experiment. They all got the same result. Now I can be more confident. What we say is the experiment, the more times you can repeat it, the word we use is valid. It's a more valid experiment. The other thing scientists do is they tell each other about the research they did. They share their results. That's called peer review. Scientists have these, um, they're almost like magazines. They're called journals. And if I have, let's say, an interest in slugs, I might subscribe to the Journal of Slug Research. And any scientist that does research on slugs might publish their research there and I can read about it so I can learn more about slugs. That's called peer review. And scientists look at each other's experience. They say, okay, well, I think you maybe did this wrong or I think you're experimentally better this way. And they sort of um, critique each other's experiments to help make sure of the results. Sometimes if your hypothesis is rejected, it's still valuable, you still learn something, you might come up with a new hypothesis. You might have a new question that you ask after the, you seeing that your hypothesis was rejected. But some experiments are better than others. There's sort of some rules. And that sort of goes along with what I was just saying. The more times an experiment is repeated or the more samples you have, the better your experiment's going to be, the more reliable, the more valid it is. Like I was just talking about, if we do an experiment and we um, 
we see uh, my coffee experiment, for example. And I give everyone a cup of coffee coming into class, and I track how much they pay attention to the notes. Well, if I did it in this class, I only have three students. I could improve that experiment if I went to a class with 30 students, right? Because I have more subjects. It's going to be more reliable. So you always want to have as many subjects of your experiment, as many samples as you can. And if you're ever asked, how can you improve an experiment? An answer is always to have more samples or to repeat the experiment, because that always makes an experiment better. More samples, um, repeating the experiment. Okay. So let's, let's think for a minute. I'm going to ask you, you all some questions. Let's, let's take, this is, I guess, similar to the experiment we're talking about. Let's say I did an experiment. And I used 30 pea plants. Anyone grow peas at home? Anyone have a garden at home? Yeah? Kai, what do you, guys, what do you grow in the garden? Oh, cool. Yeah, my, my garden didn't do too well this year. Deer, deer are bad for my garden. Like, they ate all my tomato plants, all the cucumbers. Um, is yours doing okay, Kai? She does? Cool. All right, so let's say we're doing an experiment with some of these pea plants, right? Kai's grandma's garden. 30, she has 30 pea plants there. Is it okay if I use that as an example, Kai? All right, so Kai's grandma has 30 pea plants growing in her backyard garden. Okay. On 10 of those plants, she doesn't give them any fertilizer. 10 of them, she sends Kaya out every day to water them with five grams of fertilizer. And then the other 10 that are left, they get 15 grams of the fertilizer. And they're in the garden growing. And then after 14 days, she sends Kaya out again, says, hey, measure how tall each of those plants are. Was she doing an experiment? Yeah, pretty good one. Follows lots of the rules we were just talking about. Okay, let me ask you. What what do you think? What hypothesis might she be testing? Like, what can you give me the hypothesis? Kaya? Okay, so you're giving me a question. You're really close to giving me the hypothesis. So the question maybe she asked was, how would different amounts of fertilizer affect her peas. Okay, our hypothesis, we have to have it as a statement. So maybe she was thinking, if I blank, then this will happen. What, how can we fill that in? Maybe her hypothesis was if, what was she testing? What do you think her prediction was? with these pea plants and the fertilizer and all this. If she did it right. Yeah, good. So we have both parts there, right? We have the if part. So if the pea plants are given different amounts of fertilizer, then the one maybe with the most fertilizer would grow the tallest, right? That would be a good hypothesis, okay? Uh, yeah, so we have, but with our hypothesis, we have to make sure it's a statement, right? If I do this, then this will happen. If pea plants are given more fertilizer, then they will grow taller. That would be an appropriate hypothesis, okay? But it has to be a statement. If pea plants are given extra fertilizer, then they will grow tall. She could have had a different hypothesis. She could have said it won't affect them. That would be an okay hypothesis. She could have said if they're given a medium amount, they'll grow better. That would have been a fine hypothesis also. 
Okay, so we're imagining in Kyle's grandmother's backyard, the garden. She's got 30 bee plants, pretty good garden, I guess. Her hypothesis is that if we give the bee plant extra fertilizer, then they're going to grow taller. Okay, so now let's think about the variables we were just talking about. What's the independent variable in this experiment? So let's take these, these notes. What's that? Not, we have to be a little more specific. Yep, exactly. So remember, the I in independent looks like what number? One. It's the one thing that's going to be different between these two plants. And Isaiah just told me. Is what? The, per the amount of fertilizer. That's the independent variable. Because that's what she's changing, right? That's what she's testing. She gave, or she made Kai, go out, Kai go out and get zero grams and 15 grams and five grams of fertilizer. So that's what she's changing. So that's the independent variable. That's what she's testing. So that's one thing different. The D variable. The D, okay, do you remember what I said about the D and D dependent variable? What word can it kind of go with? It's the data you're going to collect. So, Kate, what do you think? What is she, what data is she collecting as this experiment's going on? What, but what is she, yes, you're cl very close. How is she going to know the effects? What is she going to actually measure? What about us? What difference? What is she actually going to measure? Well, she's changing that, like, but she has a bee plant right in front of her. How is she going to know if the fertilizer helps them? She's going to measure their size, size maybe the height. Right? So the, we want to be specific. You know, and, and Kate was right, it is about the bee plant, but I was just looking for a little bit more specific answer. The height of the bee plant. That's the data she's collecting. The height of the bee plant. So D and D kind of variable goes with D for the data they collect. You guys are doing great. Okay, but then there's these other variables. We call them control variables. So we said, in a good experiment, we only want one thing different. And as Aaron told us, it's the fertilizer. So what are the other variables that we're going to try and keep the same for all 30 of these plants? Okay? Location. Location. They're all in the same spot in his grandmother's backyard. That's one variable I'll talk. What would be another one? Uh, yeah, we would probably give them whatever, two weeks. Right? We don't want to get measure some plants after one week and some after two weeks. That wouldn't make sense. So yeah, the amount of time. So the soil. We want them all growing in the same soil. We want them all getting the same amount of sun and water. water. And you know, all these other you could keep coming up with a long list. But the key thing to know is that we want to keep everything the same. The only thing we want different is the what? Fertilizer. So you could, you don't have to write down, you could just write down whatever ones you want. Amount of soil, type of soil, amount of water, and so forth. Okay, almost there. Um, the groups. Right? When we have an experiment, we want to try and have a control group and one or two experimental groups. Okay. What's the control group in this experiment? That's well, they're all peas, but a specific group of the peas. Remember, the control group is the group we're using for comparison. I don't know, is it? Maybe it's the normal. Which one? It is the normal. 
So the control group is the one that you're not changing anything, right? That would be the bees that Kaya doesn't go out and give any fertilizer, the ones with zero fertilizer. So what about those other groups? What do we call the other ones? Experimental groups, right? The ones that are getting five grams of fertilizer and, and 15 grams, those are our two experimental groups. Okay. Last question for you then. So how can we make this experiment better? How could we improve this experiment? There's always two answers that you could say for almost any experiment. What makes a better experiment? Okay, I could repeat this experiment again. And if I get the same results, I'm like, oh, I must be onto something. The same thing happened. Or another, I could use more pea plants. Rather than 30, if I use 100, and I got the results, I could really be confident. If I use 200, then I'd really be super confident. So we could use more plants or you could repeat your experiment. Those are both good ways of improving an experiment. Bless you. All right, great job, guys. Any questions about variables or the control groups or experiments at this point? Okay, we're going to take a pause in our notes for now. Mm -hmm.